Hello, bonjour, Kuyanamik. D'abord, merci de votre patience. Je serai très bref. J'aimerais vous remercier d'être ici pour, uh, et de vous être joint à nous aujourd'hui. I'd particularly like to thank President Obed, the Prime Minister and, and Inuit leadership for participating in today's meeting. The Inuit Crown Partnership Committee meetings are an incredibly important space for us to convene and to discuss Inuit priorities, which the Government of Canada shares and is committed to advancing in the spirit of self-determination and partnership. One of these clear and important priorities over the last few years has been the development of the Inuit Nunangat policy. It's a transformative agreement that includes over 30 departments and agencies of the government in Canada and, and that recognizes a whole of government approach to work with Inuit's rights holders in Inuit Nunangat to provide a much needed framework for moving forward on Inuit priorities, including economic de development and the implementation of land claims. Uh, I'm grateful to work with the Inuit Taprit Kanatami and President Obed in particular and really look forward to continuing that work. I will leave it there right now and uh, on that note, hand it over to the Prime Minister. Merci. Thanks for that introduction, Mark, and thank you everyone for being here. Koyan Namik. Cet après-midi, j'étais avec Nathan Obed, le président de l'organisme national Inuit Tapirit Kanatami. Ensemble, on a co-présidé une rencontre productive du comité de partenariat entre les Inuits et la Couronne. At the meeting, all members of the committee endorsed the new Inuit Nunangat policy. This policy recognizes the Inuit homeland, Inuit Nunangat, as a distinct geographical, cultural, and political region. Today, the partnership committee between the Inuits and the Crown approved the new. Inuit Nunangat s'étend du Yukon et des territoires du Nord-Ouest à l'Ouest jusqu'au Labrador à l'Est et englobe la terre, l'eau et la glace. Cette entente est la première de son genre. This historic policy will make sure Inuit priorities are incorporated into federal initiatives that impact Inuit and Inuit Nunangat. For example, when the federal government is looking to make investments in marine infrastructure in the Arctic, or the Department of Fisheries and Oceans is working to set regional boundaries, we will work with Inuit partners across Inuit Nunangat. This policy is about supporting Inuit-led solutions to distinctly Inuit challenges, promoting prosperity and equity, and recognizing Inuit self-determination. As we work to combat issues across Inuit Nunangat, such as food security or connectivity, the INP will be a blueprint for working in partnership with the Inuit. To support implementation of this transformative whole-of-government policy, the federal government has committed $25 million over five years. This is long overdue, but today marks an important step in our journey towards reconciliation. I want to give a special thank you to Natan and to the collected Inuit leadership for your extraordinary de dedication in making this policy a reality. All of government will have a role to play in bringing this policy to life and ensuring its meaningful implementation. By doing so, it will benefit all those in the Inuit homeland and make all of Canada stronger. Notre gouvernement va continuer de travailler de près avec ses partenaires Inuit pour mettre en œuvre cette politique et faire avancer nos priorités communes, comme lutter contre les changements climatiques, protéger l'Arctique et investir dans le logement. Merci. Thank you. Nakomik. I'll now turn it over to President Obed. Uh, thank you to the Prime Minister and also thank you, Minister Miller, who have been instrumental in ensuring that we get to today, which is um, the announcement of the Inuit Nunangat policy. S sometimes on the path to reconciliation, we have days where there are apologies, uh, days where there are large funding announcements for, that bring equity to Inuit communities. And other times, in this Crown-Inuit relationship, 
There are days where we um, create systemic change across the bureaucracy and across federal departments. And this policy uh, allows for that to happen. In any given day, um, the Government of Canada makes a myriad of decisions around um, Inuit, First Nations and Métis. It could be in relation to policies, it could be in relation to programs, legislation, it could be the considerations in relation to uh, positions in, in uh, court cases. We now have this particular policy that will underpin all of those considerations um, that the government makes when considering how to involve Inuit and how to articulate Inuit Nunangat uh, within the federal public service and within the decision making. Inuit Nunangat comprises 35% of Canada's landmass. It encompasses upwards to 70% of Canada's coastline. It is a distinct geopolitical space where Inuit have settled land claim agreements, modern treaties, uh, and that there are four distinct Inuit regions. These regions come together in unity at the national level through Inuit Tepri Kanatsumi, and we in turn um, at Inuit Tepri Kanatsumi bring the Canadian Inuit positions to government. Through this Inuit Crown process, we have been successful in articulating why such a policy is necessary and have worked constructively in co-development with the federal government over the past um, few years to get to this place today. Inuit are not a part of the Indian Act. Uh, we are citizens of provinces and territories. We have a very particular way in which we interact with the Crown, which is distinct from Métis and from First Nations. The necessity of a policy like this that instructs government on how to engage with Inuit and how to re uh, respect Inuit self-determination, how to respect the place that Inuit have within the Constitution, and also how to respect the way in which Inuit have chosen to mobilize politically and um, from a, um, an issues-based perspective, will allow the federal government to make better decisions. No longer do we as Inuit have to go piecemeal to every single individual within um, federal departments in which uh, areas would we want to make a difference. There will now be a foundation of knowledge that we will expect from federal departments and from those who have to work on Inuit issues or who have Inuit considerations in uh, their portfolios. And we can build upon that foundation instead of start anew across all federal departments. I want to thank again the Prime Minister for his leadership uh, in seeing this through to the end and to today, and also the leadership of Minister Miller and his Cabinet colleagues in this transformative um, policy that will um, be, affect positive change for years to come. Nakomik. Thank you. We now have 20 minutes for questions from media. Nous avons maintenant 20 minutes pour des questions des médias. One question, one follow-up limit. Un question et un suivi. On va commencer avec la première journaliste. Hi, Prime Minister Tom Perry, CBC. I'd like to get your response to the latest uh, sanctions announced by Russia, the travel bans on more than 60 Canadians, including uh, politicians, members of your staff, and journalists. Now, if I could get, you that, uh, get that in English and French, that would be very helpful. I can speak for all of the latest rounds of Russian sanctions that uh, when I say that this does not weaken our resolve one whit uh, from doing everything we can to stand up for Ukraine and pushing back hard against Vladimir Putin's murderous regime. His decision to invade a sovereign independent nation for um, reasons that violate international law, the behavior we've seen of Russian troops and the Russian leadership in regards to Ukraine has consisted of war crimes, and Canada remains determined to be there to support Ukraine, to be there to push back on Russia, including with crippling sanctions of a, of a, of a scale never before seen against a major economy. 
and continue to work with the international community, including the International Criminal Court, to hold Vladimir Putin and his cronies to account. Je peux vous rassurer que ces nouvelles sanctions ne vont aucunement ralentir notre fervent détermination de continuer à repousser contre cette guerre illégale de Vladimir Poutine et du leadership russe, de défendre l'Ukraine et d'être là pour nos amis ukrainiens avec de l'aide financière, humanitaire et militaire, et de continuer de travailler avec nos partenaires et alliés à travers le monde pour s'assurer que Vladimir Poutine soit tenu responsable avec ceux qui l'endosse et l'encourage pour les crimes de guerre, pour les atrocités qui sont en train d'être commises, pas juste contre les Ukrainiens, mais contre euh, la, les, les règles et le système international. On uh, military assistance to Ukraine, I was just hoping to get some clarity on the timing of the artillery that you were talking about. You started talking about artillery shortly after your meeting with uh, President Biden and with other um, allied uh, leaders. I'm wondering if pressure was put on Canada at that meeting to step up its uh, shipments of uh, lethal aid. And also, in terms of the timing, I know you don't want to go into things because of operational security, but how long are the Ukrainians going to have to wait to get their hands on this heavy artillery, which they say they need now? We have been uh, engaged closely with President Zelensky and uh, Ukrainian leadership every step of the way since the beginning of the war, since before the beginning of the war, and every step of the way, Canada has been responsive to their needs. Uh, we know that a new phase of the war is starting up right now uh, with heavy bombardment uh, in the east by Russia, uh, and the Ukrainians have asked for heavy artillery, and we will be delivering. Okay, next question. Hey, Prime Minister, Chris Anaskut, hey, CTV National News. Uh, Sweden and Finland have been moving towards potentially joining NATO because of the war in Ukraine. Would Canada support them joining the alliance? One of the stated goals that Vladimir Putin had in justifying this illegal criminal invasion of Ukraine was that he wanted to push back NATO. He wanted to uh, ensure that NATO stops expanding and uh, impacting on Russia, which, of course, is a wrong-headed justification because NATO is a defensive alliance and we pose no threat to Russia. But his actions in invading Ukraine have actually had the direct opposite effect, and conversations are being had around uh, Sweden and Finland uh, looking to join NATO, and Canada, of course, is very supportive of that. And sports organizations like Wimbledon is banning Russia, Russian and Belarusian athletes. Should the NHL and other organizations ban these athletes as well? And will you ban visas for Russian athletes here? Uh, we have to recognize that uh, Vladimir Putin and his cronies, the uh, Kremlin and those who support the Kremlin, are responsible for war crimes, for a destabilization, destabilization of the international rules-based order, are directly responsible not just for atrocities committed in Ukraine, but for a spike in energy prices around the world that is going to hurt families here in Canada and even more in the global south. Vladimir Putin is responsible for uh, a food crisis that is going to lead to higher prices for everyone and shortages and even famine for some. Vladimir Putin and his regime needs to be held to account for this. This is why we've moved forward with some of the strongest sanctions ever been applied towards a major economy. And uh, we are also looking to remove Russia from multilateral organizations and from benefiting from international cooperation and, yes, even competition. Russia and Russians need to know that they cannot 
violate the stability and peace that has characterized so many uh, years of growth, of opportunity for so many, and go without consequences. That's why the world is talking about all the different ways in which we can push back unequivocally against Russia. Next question, please. Hi, Prime Minister. Amanda Connolly with Global News. You said this week that you plan to crack down on foreign buyers who are using Canadian real estate as an asset. Bank of Canada data, though, says investors, what they defined as mainly domestic buyers, are the ones who outpace first-time home buyers buying up property during the pandemic. While StatsCan warned last week, multiple property buyers are constraining already tight housing supplies in Canadian cities. Are you open to imposing a higher tax on secondary or subsequent properties in order to discourage domestic investors from eating up supply that would normally be available to first-time home buyers? Housing should be available to families looking to build a home, looking to build a future, looking to start that path to creating greater equity that will uh, help them financially throughout their life and into retirement. And that's a reality that is getting further and further away from far too many people. That's why in Budget 2022, we're moving forward with significant measures to increase supply, to help families save, and to, yes, crack down on speculation, to ensure that housing is focused on creating homes, not asset classes. This is why, uh, whether it's our measures to ban foreign buyers for the next two years, whether it's cracking down on predatory practices like blind bidding or house flipping, these are measures that are going to support families as we try to address this significant challenge in real, concrete ways. I, I would like a, before I ask my follow-up here, I would like a yes or no answer to that question of whether you are open to taxing subsequent properties, please. My follow-up is that conditions for young people, as I'm sure you've seen, are getting worse right now. By what date do you plan to introduce and implement the first time, sorry, the Home Buyers Bill of Rights to ban things like waiving inspections? We know that there are no simple answers in the housing issue. There is uh, just significant numbers of different angles and programs that we need to put forward that we need to get right. As we see inflation rise, as we see people uh, looking at the increased value of their own homes, we need to at the same time make sure that young families, that first-time home buyers have access to the housing market. That's why addressing supply is so unbelievably important. Our population is growing faster than the supply of housing. That's why over the next 10 years, we will be uh, working to double the new housing starts across this country, including by investing directly billions of dollars to support municipalities to accelerate the construction of new housing. We know that it's going to take a range of initiatives and investments to support families as they get into their new homes, and that's exactly what we're here for. Bonjour, M. Trudeau, Marie Chabot, Johnson, Radio Canada. Um, je voulais un peu plus vous entendre en fait sur la question um, de la controverse autour du Canadien national et de leur uh, CA. À la lumière de ce qui s'est passé, est-ce que, d'après vous, vous devriez euh, modifier la, la loi sur les langues officielles pour ajouter des modalités comme la composition des euh, conseils d'administration? Je vais être honnête, j'ai été époustouflé euh, d'entendre cette situation-là. Qu'une compagnie comme la CN, une compagnie euh, nationale assujettie aux règles fédérales, assujettie à la loi sur les langues officielles, n'ait pas vu ce qui s'est passé à Air Canada et pas appris leur, la, la leçon qui me semblait tout à fait évidente. Euh, je comprends à quel point les gens sont frustrés. Moi aussi, je le suis. Euh, alors, j'ai demandé euh, euh, au ministre approprié de s'assurer que la CN travaille rapidement pour rectifier la situation. Et nous sommes toujours là pour défendre la loi sur les langues officielles. Nous sommes toujours là pour défendre le principe des deux langues officielles du Canada. Et nous allons continuer de l'être. On comprend qu'il va y avoir un membre qui va être nommé dans, dans les prochaines semaines, là, mais ça reste un membre sur un, un conseil qui en compose 11. Je leur demande, est-ce qu'on devrait avoir des modalités pour exiger qu'il y ait un certain nombre minimal de francophones sur des, les, les, les compagnies du, de Écoutez, les, les francophones, euh, les Québécois, euh, 
à travers le pays euh, devraient avoir la chance de siéger surtout sur les grandes compagnies nationales comme la CN, euh, comme Air Canada. Les Canadiens d'expression française à travers le pays devraient se voir refléter dans nos grandes institutions nation euh, nationales. Euh, et donc, euh, comme j'ai dit, nous allons regarder euh, qu'est-ce que la CN va proposer comme solution à cette situation inacceptable et on va espérer que euh, les, les grandes compagnies au Canada vont enfin apprendre la leçon qu'il faut respecter euh, les principes du bilinguisme dans notre pays. Bonjour, M. Trudeau. Michel Sabat, la presse canadienne. Vous avez parlé de réconciliation tantôt dans votre discours, mais j'aimerais vous en parler. Vous vous souvenez sûrement de votre promesse phare de 2015 dans cette élection qui vous a mené au pouvoir. Vous promettiez de lever les avis d'ébullition d'eau potable dans toutes les communautés au plus tard, en mars 2021. Bien, on est en avril 2022 et il y en a toujours, il y en a toujours 34. Alors, c'est quoi la nouvelle cible? Parce que, je veux dire, il faut bien une nouvelle cible à un moment donné. On est aussi en 2022. Ben, la cible, c'est d'éliminer tous les avis d'ébullition d'eau. Quand on est arrivé euh, au gouvernement en 2015, après des décennies de gouvernements de, de différentes euh, allégeances politiques, qui ont échoué à cette responsabilité qui nous semblait pas mal euh, de base, d'assurer de l'eau potable pour toutes les communautés à travers le pays, nous avions agi. Et il y avait 109 habits d'ébullition d'eau à travers le pays. On en a maintenant euh, levé 120. Effectivement, il y a des communautés qui se sont ajoutées. Il y en a d'autres qui euh, ont, ont perduré plus longtemps qu'on aurait voulu. Mais dans chaque, chacune des 34 communautés qui restent, il y a un plan euh, il y a le financement, il y a le travail qui est en train de se faire parce qu'on va éliminer aussi rapidement que possible tous ces avis d'ébullition d'eau et pas l'éliminer pour une semaine ou pour un mois, mais pour de bon. C'est ça notre but. D'accord. Je comprends que vous n'avez donc pas de nouvelles cibles précises de quand ce sera réglé une bonne fois pour toutes. Bon, D'autre part, sur l'Ukraine, le gouvernement fédéral s'est engagé à organiser des vols nodisés pour les Ukrainiens. Ça fait environ deux semaines que votre ministre des Transports a promis euh, ça, puis il n'y a rien depuis. Alors, euh, hier, on nous a parlé de points aéroplans. C'est pour quand les vols nodisés? Nous sommes là euh, pour accueillir des Ukrainiens au Canada. Comme on sait, euh, il y a des vols euh, à tous les jours entre l'Europe et le Canada, et il y a beaucoup d'Ukrainiens qui euh, prennent ces vols-là. Il y a aussi beaucoup d'Ukrainiens qui, euh, des femmes et des enfants qui sont en Pologne, en Roumanie ou à Berlin, qui ne veulent pas à aller trop loin de leur mari, surtout avec euh, Kiev qui commence à, à rouvrir, avec l'armée euh, russe qui se retire. Mais nous avons, euh, nous avons mis en place des mesures accélérées euh, d'octroi de, de visa. Nous, nous avons euh, accepté des centaines de milliers euh, d'applications. On, euh, euh, on, on a donné des réponses positives à des dizaines de milliers et on a reçu euh, plus de 10 000 Ukrainiens au Canada euh, depuis les derniers mois. On va continuer d'être là avec toutes les mesures nécessaires, y compris des vols nolisés. Prochaine question. Bonjour, M. Trudeau, Raphaël Pierrot de l'Agence QMI. D'abord, euh, élection présidentielle en France. Euh, votre réflexion là-dessus, est-ce que vous endossez un candidat en particulier? Oui. Évidemment, c'est une décision très importante pour les Français. Euh, ils, euh, ils vont avoir un choix à faire euh, dimanche euh, qui va avoir un grand impact sur euh, leur vie euh, et sur euh, le parcours de la France. Mais je dois souligner que depuis plusieurs années, euh, j'ai euh, l'honneur et le plaisir de travailler aux côtés euh, du président Macron que ce soit sur les changements climatiques, que ce soit euh, sur euh, la croissance économique euh, inclusive, que ce soit sur les enjeux internationaux et la protection de la démocratie. Et je peux dire que ce serait une bonne chose pour le Canada et pour le monde qu'on puisse continuer de travailler avec Emmanuel dans les années à venir. En anglais, s'il vous plaît. Obviously, uh, this is a decision for French citizens. It's an important one about how they move forward uh, as a country and as a democracy. But let me add that 
over the past years, I have um, had the good fortune of working alongside President Macron uh, on important issues for Canada and for the world, whether it be on climate change, on uh, inclusive growth, or on uh, standing up on big international issues like the protection of democracy and fighting disinformation. And I can tell you that it would be a good thing for Canada and it would be a good thing for the world to be able to continue to work with uh, Emmanuel Macron on that. Merci beaucoup. Et uh, deuxièmement, en fait, il y a des rapports uh, uh, qui sortent et qui, uh, apparemment, uh, les États-Unis et certains autres pays qui envoient des armes en Ukraine ne sont pas nécessairement au courant uh, des détails de quand les armes uh, arrivent en Ukraine. On ne sait pas exactement qu'est-ce qui arrive. Je veux savoir, le Canada, est-ce qu'on est au courant? Est-ce qu'on a une confirmation? Quand nos armes arrivent sur place, est-ce qu'on sait qu'est-ce qui se passe avec? Oui. Euh, chaque fois qu'on a envoyé des armes, de l'équipement, euh, on est capable de savoir exactement quand ils arrivent et quand ils euh, sont, euh, sont en train d'être utilisés euh, par les Ukrainiens. Évidemment, euh, c'est un, un zone de conflit, euh, mais on sait que l'aide qu'on a envoyée, incluant euh, l'aide militaire, les armements, euh, est arrivée et est en train d'être utilisée. Hi, Prime Minister Stephanie Taylor with the Canadian Press. A senior military officer, Lieutenant General Trevor Cadu, who has been investigated for alleged uh, sexual misconduct, has retired and traveled to Ukraine. Were you informed of this, and what do you make of his actions? Uh, obviously, I'm not going to speak uh, about any individual case that is uh, currently under investigation, but uh, as you well know, uh, Canada takes very seriously any allegations of misconduct, and we will continue to be there to ensure uh, that women and men who serve in our Canadian Armed Forces are uh, properly uh, supported, respected, uh, and uh, given uh, the kind of uh, environment that is worthy of their choice to serve our country. On a different topic, you spoke about sanctions earlier, but a senator has proposed a bill that would give Canada sanctions more teeth, allowing governments to seize frozen assets and donate them to humanitarian groups or foreign government. In this case, that would allow Canada to seize the riches of oligarchs and give it to Ukraine. Do you support this bill? There are reflections always on how we can go even further in our sanctions. As you've seen, we continue to step up our lists of sanctions. The most important thing around sanctions, however, is to be coordinated uh, with all of our allies. Uh, and that's the unity that we've seen across Europe and around the world that is most uh, devastating uh, to the Kremlin and to Putin himself. The fact that we have closed loopholes, the fact that there is a uh, firmness and, and uh, a strength of unity anytime Putin looks at NATO, at Europe, or at democracies around the world, even at the UN, where 141 countries stood up to condemn Vladimir Putin's actions in invading Ukraine. These are things uh, that have a real impact, and we will continue to look for more ways to continue uh, to punish Putin and his regime for their illegal, unconscionable war in Ukraine. We'll take the last question. Uh, hi, Prime Minister Trudeau. I'm Miral with Nunatsiak News. Um, I have a question for you and Mr. Obed. I'd like to know how the success of the new Inuit Nunanga policy will be measured over the next um, five years as it's being implemented. It's an excellent question, and thank you. Uh, the reality is, over the past years, uh, we have moved forward in a historic partnership the federal government working directly with Inuit leadership on a range of issues that impact upon uh, Inuit uh, uh, Nunangat, uh, whether it's on housing, whether it's on infrastructure, whether it's on health outcomes, whether it's on education, the kinds of partnerships we've been able to build have been significant. At the same time, however, we know that it's not just about the great relationship that this government has. Uh, with Inuit leadership. It's about building a system that is going to transform that relationship for the long term. As Natan said quite beautifully, there are some days where the government stands up and talks about reconciliation through an apology. There are some days when the government stands up and talks about reconciliation through significant investments of massive funds to close equity gaps. Today, this announcement is about transforming the systemic inequities 
that happen within government, where decisions get taken about the North without including the Inuit in those decisions. This represents a change so that it's not just the ministries of Crown Indigenous Relations or Northern Affairs or Indigenous Services that engage with Inuit leadership. It will be every single department across the government that when it wants to build a wharf in the north, put in a new airport, move forward on a new mental health policy, look to uh, support something around fisheries, will do so in partnership, in consultation with uh, the Inuit. That is the change that is going to uh, unlock so much, not just for the coming years, but for the coming decades. And with that, I'm very happy to turn it over to Natan. I'll make for the question. The ability to monitor progress often comes through specific financial resources in federal budgets or the articulation of announcements for particular um, areas such as housing or tuberculosis elimination uh, or education or post-secondary education that are one-offs. What, what we are hoping in the next five years is to see uh, the way in which the Government of Canada articulates opportunities for Indigenous peoples to be uh, uh, coloured by or influenced by the foundation of the Inuit Nunangat policy. So that uh, when there are new opportunities, when there are terms and conditions of uh, funds that flow to pr Treasury Board and back to particular departments, that Inuit considerations are thought of as a part of the process rather than exceptional in the process. We, we won't necessarily be able to quantify each and every time the Inuit Nunagat policy has had a positive impact on the ways in which Inuit are eligible for federal funds or Inuit individuals are eligible for particular programs or services that they may not have been if it was not for this policy. But we will continue to try to understand the positive effect and we will work with um, departments, especially the departments that we historically have not worked uh, in close collabor collaboration with. We have only recently started working more with, say, Infrastructure Canada or uh, uh, Department of uh, Agriculture and Food in things such as um, our infrastructure deficit or food insecurity across Inuit Nunangat. We, as part of the implementation of this Inuit Nunangat policy and the funds that are announced today, will for sure have an evaluative um, piece within the implementation of this, and we will be able to articulate that over time. Uh, thank you for the question. I also do have a follow-up. Um, I was wondering, what does it mean to be recognized as a distinct region? And um, if you and Prime Minister Trudeau could elaborate on how this policy uh, may or may not affect talks of self-government. Well, Inuit Nunangat is a concept and one that is being uh, more widely used by Canadians, not just by Inuit. We have described this as our homeland, and since we have mobilized since the, uh, the 1970s to today, we have uh, signed modern treaties with the Government of Canada, and we have uh, imagined our homeland now in a very different geopolitical way than we may have in the 1970s when it was just understood to be our land. Uh, but now it, it means much more, especially within the relationship piece with the Government of Canada and globally in the threat of Arctic sovereignty. Uh, Canada and Inuit aligned in this particular way that recognizes Inuit Nunangat significantly enhances Canada's Arctic sovereignty. Inuit are the foundation of Arctic sovereignty in Canada. That has always been the case since the formation of this country and we hope that it will continue to be the case moving forward. We look forward to uh, maximizing the ability to work uh, with the Government of Canada on these issues, and we also are very thankful for the, the approach that the Canadian Government has taken in relation to the implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, 
the understanding and affirmation um, and exercising of Section 35 rights under the Constitution, and then building upon Supreme Court rulings and other legislation that has created the environment for this to happen in a way that um, benefits both Inuit and the Government of Canada. Just to pick up on that theme of, of sovereignty, um, we are in a time of, of reflection around how we ensure Canada's continued sovereignty in the Arctic. And in times past, or government's past, that would have happened through a military lens. Uh, can we put more bases in the north? Can we uh, show that we're ready to defend and control our Arctic? What this policy, and quite frankly the relationship that we've built over the past uh, numbers of years in the Crown and in Inuit partnership, is that sovereignty in the north passes through the people who live there and who have lived there for millennia. This is where the best way to ensure we are standing up for Canadian sovereignty is to recognize those people who were the first Canadians, who were Canadians first, Inuits. And recognizing Inuit Nananga and understanding that, yes, even as we new, move forward on NORAD modernization and investments in defense in the North, which we are, it needs to be done not just in consultation and partnership with Inuit, but with a mind to say, okay, if we're building uh, a new airstrip here, is that going to fit uh, with Inuit priorities and economic development? How can we make investments that strengthen and value the people who have always defended that land, who've always lived on that land? That's the approach that we're highlighting today with the uh, Inuit Nunangat policy. This idea that the best way to move forward is in partnership and understanding of the shared goals we have for prosperity for the people living in the north, security, stability, and opportunity, all the while highlighting and strengthening culture, language, identity, and those things that build resilient futures, resilient communities. That's what this announcement is, and quite frankly, it's as good an example of the kind of path towards reconciliation we need to walk, not just in the north, but everywhere across the country. And I, I really want to highlight just how extraordinary and visionary the Inuit leadership has been over these past years as we're trying to figure out and develop better reconciliation and a better future for all Canadians, including the Inuit. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Merci, ceci m'y fait la conférence de presse. That concludes today's press conference.